very good evening good morning to all our viewers present in different parts of the world welcome everybody to our 14th lecture of the centenary lecture series from punjab engineering college chandigarh fondly known as spec i'm divya bansal currently the dean of alumni and in international relations and also professor of computer science at spec i'm very pleased to welcome our distinguished speaker professor mrikanka sur who's the newton professor of neuroscience and a decorated scientist at mit he'll be formally introduced to all of you we are to all of you shortly for pec this is a very special year as we enter into our centenary celebrations and thus turned 100 years young dr dheeraj sanghi joined us in january 2019 as our director sadly dr sanghi will be leaving us in the end of the month and today in our 14th lecture we will perhaps be seeing him last as our director here In his short stint, he brought several extraordinary changes in PEC, including innovations in curriculum, faculty recruitment, and institutional management to inculcate and promote excellence by faculty and students. PEC has been extremely fortunate to have him as the director, guided by his commitment to education and research, and to the health and safety of the entire PEC community. Without further ado, may I now request our director, Dr. Dhiraj Sanghi, to address our viewers and formally welcome. Professor Mrigang Sur, sir, over to you. Thank you, Divya. I'm just so delighted to have Professor Mrigang Sur here. Uh, you know, I have heard him only once, uh, and I and I am a big fan of his. He is one of those people uh, for whom no introduction is adequate, and yet it's my you know pleasant duty to introduce him. So I'm going to level best. Uh, you know as i said won't be able to say everything about him uh, also i'm going to introduce mr naresh sahel our distinguished alumnus uh, you know dr sur is id kanpur graduate that itself you know, i'm sorry because this this crowd is mostly i but you know i'm an id kalam and he is an id kalam so there is this bond and i think that makes him great uh, sorry back guys Uh, he is a pioneer in the study of brain plasticity and its mechanisms. Uh, he is the Newton Professor of Neuroscience and Director at Simon Center uh, for the Social Brain at MIT. He is also a visiting faculty member at IIT Madras. Uh, N.R. Narayan Murthy, Distinguished Chair in Computational Brain Research at the Center for Computational Brain Research, IIT Madras. Numerous awards, numerous honors. Uh, let me just name a few of them. Uh, at MIT, he is. and uh, honored with newton chair he has been elected to royal society of london national academy of sciences india the international neuropsychological symposium uh, meghna saha award for the uh, from iet india charles J jetson uh, herrick award for, of the american association for anatomists distinguished alumnus award of iit kanpur nih brain initiative inaugural award he is an fellow of royal society of uk the national academy of medicine of the us american academy of arts and science american association for the advancement of science okay the third world academy of sciences the indian national science academy the list goes on and on and on right uh, let me also take a few seconds to introduce our host naresh sahgal who is going to ask questions uh, from dr sur at the end of his talk Uh, Dr. Sagal is 1984 graduate of PEC in electrical engineering. Uh, he is MS and PhD from Syracuse University, New York. And after working at Intel for 31 years in chip design uh, and software area, he has recently joined Nova Signal, a Intel startup, uh, as you know, senior vice president for cloud engineering. It's an honor for me and for all of us to have Dr. Sur. Uh, give a distinguished lecture today, and for uh, Dr. Nay Sahgal to be hosting this lecture. Thank you very much, and I request Dr. Sur to give his lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Dheeraj, for your very kind introduction. I'm going to share my slides and uh, get started. Okay. I hope everybody can see my slides and uh, just give me a thumbs up. All right. so i'm very honored to be invited to give the centenary uh centennial lecture of punjab engineering college uh, today uh, uh and uh i'm going to talk today about some work that our field of neuroscience 
has revealed about how the brain works and the ways in which that knowledge may, may transform what is already one of the most active fields in all of engineering, namely artificial intelligence. But before I start, I'm going to talk a little about whoops, my former colleague, my very senior colleague, Hargobind Khurana. This also is almost the centenary of Khurana's birth. Uh, Hargobind Khurana, or Gobind as he wanted to be called himself, as he signed his name below this picture taken when he was just about 60 years old at MIT, uh, 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 was born in a Raipur village in Multan, in, in Punjab, in what was then undivided Punjab. Then he did his schooling in Multan and Lahore, and then he did his PhD at Liverpool, ended up after British Columbia and Wisconsin at MIT. And Gobind Khurana is one of the most celebrated uh, uh, biologists of our time. He, he won the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology in 1968 when he was merely 46 years old with Marshall Nirenberg and Robert Hawley for their interpretation of the genetic code and its function in protein synthesis. They discovered that DNA makes RNA, that was known, but how does RNA make protein? So triplets of RNA encode different peptides or not even the stop codons. And this was a revolutionary discovery that laid the groundwork subsequently of all the RNA vaccines that we see today that have been made for COVID, for instance. But even more importantly, as he was moving to MIT and at MIT, he did something even more revolutionary in my opinion, for which he should have been awarded a second Nobel prize, which is that he synthesized genes. He was able to synthesize as a chemist who became a biologist. He founded the field of chemical biology and was able to synthesize in the laboratory oligonucleotides or pieces of DNA that he could put into bacteria and show that they actually made RNA and protein. And this was the start of the biotechnology revolution and of genetic engineering. So Karana in my mind is a jewel of Indian science. We must claim him as an Indian scientist even though he did all of his work abroad. His work exemplifies something that we are also going to pick up on today, which is that fundamental science has profound applications in engineering. Khurana's work shows that with the fundamental elements of life, how DNA and RNA make proteins and how that knowledge can be used to make better medicines or transform life itself through crops and crop design and so on. And today we are going to talk about how fundamental understanding of the brain and how the brain creates the mind and similarly impact what we regard as the next great revolution in engineering, which is artificial intelligence. So I'm going to talk today about three things very quickly. And I know I have a time limit of about 35 minutes or less now. Uh, I'm going to talk about not all of artificial intelligence, but one component, perhaps the most important component of artificial intelligence as we know it today, namely machine learning. And what does machine learning encompass? Even what does it mean? Second, we will skip on to how does artificial intelligence match up against so-called natural intelligence or what we sometimes badly call biological intelligence. How does the brain create cognition? Cognition is a much better word for what the brain does. So some very brief elements of how does the brain create cognition? How do we know? how the brain works and creates the mind. And then finally, how might understanding brain mechanisms of cognition understand the building of intelligent machines or advanced artificial intelligence, at least in the ways that we can predict for now. All right, so machine intelligence or machine learning is inspired by the brain but has had relatively little contact with brain science. And I'm going to explain that in a minute, but machine learning has been transformative 
in our lifetime. It is driven by massive amounts of data. It's driven by massive computational power, but with very simple architectures and learning rules. The five major companies that deal with machine learning, well, the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, plus Microsoft, have a market capitalization of more than $9 trillion. Just in the last year, their capitalization has gone up by about 30 or 40%. Their revenues, if they were a, comp if they were a country, would be like number five in the world in terms of GDP. So this is an extraordinary growth of machine intelligence and the ubiquitousness of machine learning in our lives. Almost everything we do today from the cell phone we have in our hand to machines, to the vision systems, speech systems, recognition systems, recommendations, or if you want to use Google Maps or, or any map, Apple Maps and go from one place to another, what is the best way these systems are all dependent. So um, large numbers of communication systems, the fact that we are having this meeting via Zoom and YouTube is hugely enabled by artificial intelligence. What does artificial intelligence encompass? So the first demonstration that a computer can be, do something interesting that the human mind also does was shown in a paper more than 60 years ago by Frank Rosenblatt. And I hope you can read this. The Rosenblatt's paper was entitled The Perceptron, a probabilistic model for information storage and organization in the brain. It actually is inspired by the brain, but has very little to do with the brain and is the simplest of ideas. If you take a one layer model, if you have two units, he, he called them neurons that connect to another neuron via quote unquote synapses. The main idea being that the connections can be changed based on evidence. What can this very simple, almost trivial network do? It can classify. If you present it, a cat and a dog, and every time you present a cat, you say, now this is a cat, learn that this is a cat. So the weight of these connections will change a little bit. Now here's a dog. And then the more data you present, what this classifier does is that it develops how to draw a border or a line between cats and dogs along two axes. These axes could be something like domestication versus size. So the larger the size of an animal, the lower is the domestication or whatever. It doesn't matter what the two axes are as long as they can be separable by a line or in more complex vectors of plane. And this demonstrates one feature of what AI is about. It's about classification and generalization. And you can see right away, even from this very simple example that I took from Wikipedia, that the more data you have, the better your line is. The line keeps shifting, the better your classifier is. This is what I mean by even simple architectures and learning rules such as a line can lead to powerful systems and this classification system is the fundamental classifier that is used today for a large number of applications in AI. Since then, we have gone on to build better and better artificial neural networks. So Perceptron is a single layer binary linear classifier, but now we can build multi-layer feed-forward networks, and a whole lot of other kinds of connectivity, recorded neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and these multi-layer feed-forward and other artificial networks can do a lot more, including nonlinear classification uh, uh, and regression, prediction, but the fundamental job of artificial intelligence today is to make machine learning algorithms that utilize statistics of data to make predictions. And these predictions come and the fundamental algorithms come in these categories. I'm not going to go into them. There is unsupervised learning, supervised learning, there are continuous and categorical categories. And I gave you an example of classification from a very simple idea of a linear classifier called a Clearly, such such machine learning requires massive amounts of data 
in order to function. That is why Google and Facebook or Netflix or Amazon want data. More the data, the better their classifiers or their generalization schemes, or at most, the other thing that they do is regression. You plot one variable against another and you define a line or you define a plane. If you get a new data point on the x-axis, what is the predicted y-axis? That is another kind of prediction that, that relies on regression. And that's yet another simple, but very powerful idea that has driven a lot of machine intelligence as we know it. But the human brain and brains in general don't work this way. The human brain creates cognition and cognition is often based on just a few examples. Cognition is based on multiple kinds of learning, on focused processing and flexible brain architectures. I have a four-year-old grandchild. Maya doesn't need to be shown 200 cats and 200 dogs to know when the next, that the next thing that she sees is a cat or a dog. She can see three dogs, which vary hugely in shape and size. And she sees a fourth dog and she, and she will say, that's a dog. Why? is because we come wired with information from the world in which we have evolved, in which we have to learn to recognize categories in order to exist and be adaptively efficient. Such examples, such, such, this leads to the idea that the human brain in order to create cognition has multiple kinds of learning. Classification problems involve supervised learning. Somebody has to tell Rosenblatt's perceptron, this is a cat, this is a dog. After hundreds of such examples, the classifier learns. Many things we learn, particularly during development, when the brain is wired, is unsupervised. We also have a lot of supervision as we learn. And importantly, there is one kind of learning that I think will be transformative for the next generation of artificial intelligence, which is reinforcement learning. So remember that and by the end of my talk, in about 30 minutes, we'll come back to reinforcement learning. We don't spend the same amount of effort on everything we do. We have attention, which leads to focused processing. And the combination of learning as well as top-down contextual processing gives our architectures flexibility. So it is not that every neuron connects to every neuron as in an artificial neural network. There are specific connections and they too can adapt and flexibly change based on the demands of the task or even the demands of internal state and of cognition. So these are the big picture ideas of my talk and I'm now going to take you into the trenches with me and tell you a little bit about how the human brain actually creates the mind or cognition. And then we will come back of the trenches and come back to asking, what have we learned that can give us insight into how artificial intelligence or machine learning can progress into the next thing? It has already made massive strides, but I believe there is a lot more to come based on how understanding how the brain works. So the human brain, has a lot of neurons. It has 80 billion neurons which live in our head. And the activity of these neurons creates the mind. We have to agree on this as a materialist view of the mind, that the mind is the product of the brain. And what the mind, what the brain creates is cognition. The Oxford English Dictionary defines cognition as the mental act or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought experience and the senses. But for most practical purposes, cognition refers to all activities of the mind, importantly, those underlying perceiving, the fact that you are looking at my slides, you are hearing me, this is perception, understanding. I hope you are able to understand most, if not everything of what I'm saying. Learning, I hope you will learn something that will be a useful thing for me to have achieved. Memory, I hope you remember. Attention, you cannot do any of this without attending. That's a hugely important component of how the mind focuses and, and tense processes and communication and reasoning. Of course, human interactions rely on communication. 
And reasoning is a crucial aspect of how the human mind works in terms of stepwise actions or thought leading to a goal. And again, by the end of my talk, we will come back and I will give you a flavor of how while computers and artificial intelligence may never reach all of these capacities of cognition, particularly that of understanding, does a computer, when it solves a problem, really understand what it's doing? I don't know. Does it feel pain? I don't know. But can it reason in the way that a human being reasons? I'm going to leave you with the idea that yes, it can, because we believe that the laws of reasoning are universal laws, okay? So keep that in mind. So the brain is made up of neurons and a neuron is a very small entity. That's why we have 80 billion of them packed into our head. And a neuron, a single neuron has a cell body, it has dendrites and all these structures. It's about one tenth of a human hair in diameter. And it takes inputs and it puts out outputs and these outputs are encoded in the form of spikes. So all information in the brain is encoded in digital or non spikes, which is why an electrical engineer like myself is fascinated by the problems of information encoding and communication and transmission that the brain represents. And of course, the second thing that makes a neuron unique is that it speaks to other neurons at junctions called synapses. And these synapses enable one neuron to connect with other neurons at chemical junctions and create networks so that groups of neurons form the processing element of the brain. A hundred neurons wired into a network are much more than a hundred times one. Neurons and networks are the engine of the brain. What do networks do? What do brain systems do? One of the crucial things that we have understood from the last 30 or so years of neuroscience is that brain networks create internal models of the world. They create internal representations of the world. The outside world or our sense of the world is not simply a, it's not simply a reflection or a mirror image of the world, but an active process by which we interpret and represent the world. These are four self portraits drawn by a German artist called Anton Redescheid. Anton Redescheid died uh, 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 some years ago, but before he died, a few years before, he had a stroke. And so after the stroke, a stroke is a process by which a part of the brain is deprived of oxygen. Either a blood vessel that brings oxygenated blood is blocked or it breaks due to a hemorrhage. So neurons only live for a, a few tens of minutes, a few minutes to tens of minutes without oxygen. They are some of the most active cells in the human body. So when they die, then the part of the brain that they live in also dies. So when a, one part of the brain has had a stroke, then it reveals what is the deficit and hence what that part of the brain did. So Redescheid being an artist, looks at a mirror and he draws self-portraits. And he draws a self-portrait on this top left soon after his stroke and then on the top right a couple of months later and then a couple of months later and then a couple of months later. A trained neurologist can take one look at this self-portrait and tell you where that stroke is. I will tell you because I can pretend to be a neurologist. This stroke is in a part of his brain called the right parietal lobe. It's in the right part of the brain, in the center of the brain. And that is because the symptom that he has is evident in his drawing. He looks at a mirror and he draws one side of his face. He draws one eye, one half of his nose and half of his mouth. The left side of his face is completely blank. It is not that he cannot see. It is not that he cannot draw. It is that he does not recognize the left side of his face as existing. It's called left spatial neglect. He refuses to recognize that there, is, there are two halves of the world, including his face. And then two more months, 
and he draws a face in which there is still poverty on the left side of his face. And then he realizes that something is wrong. So he turns his face away and then Vedashait was lucky, he recovered. Most times, many times after a stroke, if the stroke is large enough, recovery is not possible because brain cells, once they die, they never really grow back. So that's yet another uniqueness about the brain. What does this tell us about how the brain works? It tells us that there are modules. It tells us that these modules process information, but it also tells us that the brain has networks that form the architecture of cognition. So cognition arises from dynamic brain representations and brain circuits that are reconfigured by plasticity and learning. And very quickly, I'm going to take you through three sets of experiments, because I cannot leave you without telling you a little bit about how neuroscientists work. How do we know what we know about the world? I'll tell you a little bit about how we know based on three kinds of experiments that are based on attention, planning, and reasoning. Experiments done in mice, which even a humble mouse shows these elements of cognition. And of course, in the human brain, these elements engage large chunks of the brain. Visual cognition, for example, engages brain systems of attention, planning, and reasoning, which we can also study in very limited form, but nonetheless clearly in mice. These systems engage different parts of the brain. Vision, for example, starts with the eyes, which sit in the front of the brain right here, but the eyes provide information to the visual cortex where visual cortex abstracts components of the visual image, but then there is the parietal cortex. This is what, in the case of Anton Radescheid, had a stroke. Parietal cortex puts together decisions, perception with decisions, and then relays that information to the frontal cortex, which acts and is also involved in planning and executive control. How do we know all this? First, attention. And then I'll talk about working memory and planning. And third, very briefly about reasoning. And we will take you into how that can inform artificial intelligence. Attention is a very core component of the human mind. And it has been difficult to program attention into computers. Attention filters and focuses information from the world. Attention is an aspect of mindfulness, which is a very important component of brain health. And here's an example of how attention works. Of course, attention works all the time. Attention, if you are at a red light, and in particular, if there is a uh, 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 fog, or if your glass, or if you are older, uh, and your glasses uh, need to be changed, you need to pay attention to see did the right, did the light turn green, and that's perceptual evidence. And if it has turned green, you make a decision: I need to move, and you press the accelerator. So perceptual attention is a crucial substrate for a decision, for decisions and action. How might we study this? Of course, you can study this in humans using brain imaging, but it doesn't tell you as much about what the internal workings are. Animal models, such as monkeys, such as rats, such as mice, provide powerful insight. And for the last many years, my laboratory has been studying mice, and mice evolved uh, about 100 millions ago, billion years ago in this tree of life. And the mouse brain is 1,000 the volume of a human brain. But if you blow up a mouse brain, so shown here to, to scale, I'm losing my mouse itself. Sorry, that was a pun. Uh, so the mouse brain is in, relate, in relative size to the human brain, teeny tiny. Yet if you blow it up, as shown here, you see that it has many of the same regions, not all of the frontal cortex and temporal cortex where we have many of the highest functions of the human brain, but the visual cortex shown in blue, the, the, the sense of touch shown in, shown in red, and importantly, the parietal cortex where vision gets transformed into decision, shown in green here, much smaller in the mouse relatively compared to human, but it exists. 
what can we do in mice in order to study the substrates of cognition? We can train mice on artificial tasks that involve what is called reinforcement learning. How do we learn? Red means stop, green means go. We are repeatedly told when we are growing up, this is the way it is in the society that we have created. And you will be rewarded for learning this because if not, you will not live because you will be run over if you go when it's red. So this is a simple, powerful form of what we call reinforcement learning. And this is an arbitrary association that my students can teach mice as well. We can teach a mice that when you see one thing, let's say horizontal bars moving up, that's a goal. Then you should lick a water spout. And when you see vertical bars moving to the right, do not lick because if you do, you will be punished. Okay? And so I'm going to show you a brief video where this is a mouse. I hope everybody can see it. Here is a lick spout. Here is a monitor. On this monitor, you will see bars that are either horizontal going up or vertical going sideways. And when the bar is horizontal, then this lick spout, then it comes forward. The mouse will lick because it has been taught. That is a go signal. And when the bars are vertical, the mouse will withhold licking because it has been taught so. And that's a correct reject signal. Okay, so here we go. So here you see uh, uh, the mouse and here is the horizontal bars and the mouse is licking, okay? And now you will see uh, vertical bars and the lick spout will come forward and the mouse is not licking. So my students are like circus trainers. They can train mice, even a teeny tiny mouse, which is about 20 grams and it's about two inches long to do this kind of behavior. And it is a component of cognition in the sense that it associates a stimulus with an action. Now, we can play a game with the mouse. We can say, we won't bring this lick spout forward regardless of what you see. So in the engaged condition, we bring the spout forward and the mouse gets a water reward. In the passive condition, we don't bring it forward. What does this do to the mouse? The mouse realizes when the spout is not coming forward, these people are playing games with me. I don't need to attend to whatever they are showing me because there is no reward possible. So the mouse switches off. And we know that the mouse switches off because we can monitor a signature of attention, which is the pupil diameter. When the pupil dilates, we, mice, attend more. What do we do with this? Well, we can image the brain. We can record the activity of single neurons in the brain. Those spikes that I showed you, we can use high resolution imaging technologies called two photon imaging and we can express calcium sensors in these neurons and we can record from hundreds and thousands of neurons from different brain regions, including the visual cortex, the parietal cortex, and we can ask what happens to the brain when the mouse sees these stimuli, the mouse creates a decision and then makes an action. And from these kinds of recordings, we discover the following, that in the parietal cortex in the middle of the brain, there are neurons that depend on attention. So here is a target stimulus. Remember I showed you that when the mouse sees horizontal bars, it should lick. So in the primary visual cortex at the back of the brain, there are neurons that respond to the target in the engaged condition, and they respond to the target or the other a, a, a stimulus in the non-engaged condition the internal state or the meaning of the stimulus has no relevance for the visual cortex. But in the parietal cortex, the internal state of attention, the meaning of the stimulus has a lot of relevance. It's during the engaged condition that the red stimulus, horizontal bars, lead to a response from these neurons. When the lick spout is not present, the animal has switched off, the animal is not attending, the animal is passively viewing the stimulus. There is no response from the very same neurons. So that's what is shown here, that in the engaged condition, the parietal cortex neurons respond, but not in the passive, whereas the visual cortex neurons respond to both conditions. So parietal neurons, but not visual cortex neurons are strongly attention dependent. 
And I remind you that the visual stimulus is identical during the engaged and passive trials. It's the same stimuli, horizontal and vertical bars. Only the internal state of attention is different. What are you going to do with this stimulus that is different? And parietal cortex reflects that. We can take this game further. We can switch for the mouse what is go and what is no go. It's as if I taught you that now green means stop and red means go. It's deeply uncomfortable because we are so socialized into thinking the other way, but we can learn this too. And mice can, of course. Now we, are, we have taught the same mouse. Now the horizontal bars means stop and the vertical bar means go. And what happens to the brain? The mouse learns this. There is a function called D prime, which is in statistical learning theory or signal detection theory, the separation between the go and the no-go response distributions in units of standard deviation. The neurons in the visual cortex show no effect of this reversal. A neuron used to respond to horizontal bars shown in the red response, and it continues to respond to the horizontal bars shown in the dotted red, even though the meaning of that horizontal bar has changed from go to no go. But in the parietal cortex, when the meaning of the bar is go, that is what makes the neuron respond. So in one case, the same neurons, that's the beauty of our technologies. We can follow that same neuron over days and weeks. And this is a neuron that used to respond to horizontal bars and that meant go. And now when we have switched the meaning for the animal, this neuron now responds to the vertical bars. And this is a remarkable example of dynamic and of dynamic changes in connectivity. So V1 neurons reflect the sensory stimulus, parietal cortex neurons respond to the rewarded stimulus and they convey a decision. So the parietal cortex transforms vision into decisions and actions. And this is enabled by synaptic plasticity, which reconfigures this circuit. And so vision comes in, gets transformed into a decision, which then moves forward into the motor cortex and will lead to limb. How does the mouse's brain generate this decision? Who is looking at this? This is a very deep question in our field. Here are these neurons in different parts of the brain but there is nobody looking at it. One part of the brain has to interpret the action of another in order to say, now I should lick or now I should not lick. And this then comes back to classification. Machine learning has led to advances in neuroscience. I'm going to end by talking about how neuroscience can influence machine learning. But right now, the same classifiers that Rosenblatt built, we can use Similarly, to look at the activity of hundreds of neurons and ask, does this activity reflect a go or a no-go? What is the dividing plane that we can mathematically define? And that is what is meant by dynamic coding of choice can be, can be decoded from the activity of these neurons. And when we do that, we find that the parietal cortex has a very rapid decoder over short periods of time, as soon as the stimulus comes on, within a second, the parietal cortex decodes and then the decoder goes down. That's what this says. The parietal cortex very rapidly makes decisions and then does away with the decision because the decision has been already conveyed. In contrast, the visual cortex neurons encode the stimulus. Is it a horizontal bar? Is it a vertical bar? for the entire duration of the task, they are static decoder, they are static encoder, whereas the parietal cortex is a dynamic encoder. That's what is meant by dynamic coding. So this leads to another powerful idea of how the human brain differs from computers and artificial uh, 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 systems. Plasticity and computation reflecting attention and decisions are embodied in the same parietal neuron. A digital computer is based on von Neumann architecture where you have a processor and you have memory and a huge amount of time, effort and energy is spent in transferring information between 
your computer's memory and your computer's process. Not so in the brain. In the brain, the same parietal cortex neuron, which does the computation, also reflects the memory of what was shown, okay? Second, very briefly, I'll tell you about planning and how in the mouse's brain, we can detect signatures of planning and how this illustrates yet another way in which cognition is represented in brains. So same task, a stimulus comes on, but now we add a delay. And then we make the lick spout come forward so that the animal licks or doesn't lick. So here's, here's the mouse. Here's the stimulus and the stimulus has gone away and there is a delay. The mouse has to remember, what did I see? And then the leg spout comes forward and the mouse, the mouse does this job well. And now we record from not only the visual cortex, but also the parietal as we I just showed you and also the motor cortex. And what do we find? What we find is that in the motor cortex shown here in red, shown here in this last column are the three kinds of, are the responses in blue from the visual cortex, in green from the parietal cortex, in red from the motor cortex, and here is the task. The stimulus comes on, there is a delay, and then there is a response period when the lick spout comes forward, okay? What is active during the delay? And what is the mouse doing during, during that delay? The mouse has to do two things. The mouse has to remember what it saw and it has to plan what to do. When the spout comes forward, it must lick. And this is an internal representation of time that the motor cortex neurons represent. I, and it is in the motor cortex that this activity stays high. I remind you, that during this delay period, there is nothing in front of the animal. There is, there is the, the stimulus has gone and the spout hasn't yet come forward. It's only the animal's cognitive state. I must remember what to do when I can in order to get my reward, when I can act. And that is working memory and planning that is held in the motor cortex. And we can read it out. You can't ask the mouse, but by recording the activity of the brain, we can read out what the mouse's brain is doing and what the mouse is thinking. Okay? And so then we can do, we can, we can learn from control theory how to represent that readout better. And we can represent that readout by deriving what are called trajectories in space and time. And this tells us how neuronal populations encode Remember, critical element in neuroscience is how does one part of the brain read out, decode what another part has encoded, okay? And so we can do this by what is called dimension reduction. This is yet another thing that we neuroscientists learn from, from statistics and engineering and most recently artificial intelligence. You can reduce the dimensionality of data if you have one neuron, if you have three neurons, then you can show that the space, that the three-dimensional space of activity is what defines these three neurons. But if you have hundreds of neurons, you need to reduce the dimensions to what's called principal component analysis. And when we do that, we can draw trajectories in space. This is how control theorists define the function of control systems, particularly with feedback. And here's what the trajectory the neuronal computational trajectory looks like for the visual cortex. The stimulus comes on and a bunch of neurons represent the stimulus. They don't care about the delay and they re return back when the stimulus has gone, has gone off. So this is an automatic response to the stimulus alone that the visual cortex represents. Very similar to what I showed you earlier. It simply reflects the stimulus. But the internal state of planning of memory is represented now in the motor cortex. And that's what I'm going to show you. And what you will see are much more complex trajectories, including the stimulus coming on right now, then the delay. During the delay, these neurons sit in the basin. It's called an attractor basin in control theory uh, 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 terminology. And then there is an action where another component hits 
and the animal legs. And so I'll just show it to you one more time because I love showing these, these uh, pictures. Whoops. So here is the stimulus coming on in the motor cortex. And here is the attractor basin where these but the response of these neurons remains high as it reflects the working memory and planning. And then the red component shows the response as you see here. All right, so what have we learned so far? What we have learned is that brain architecture is flexible and reconfigurable. And it enables cognitive states such as attention and cognitive functions such as decision-making. Okay, and that I showed you from the parietal cortex. We've also learned that neural dynamics in brain networks, such as the motor cortex, enable functions such as working memory and planning. And this flexible reconfiguration of connections, of pathways, of networks, configured by learning, in this case, reinforcement learning, likely underlies some of the highest attributes of the human mind, such as imagination and creativity, all right? So now, let's go to the last part of my talk. What does this tell us about how we might build intelligence or artificial intelligence or machines that perform, might perform tasks similar to human? So there was a philosopher named Herbert Dreyfus who in 1972 wrote a book called What Computers Can't Do. And Dreyfus argued that computers may do mechanically the things that we tell them to do but they will never have understanding. And so, so this was a critique of the early days of artificial intelligence. It was called old fashioned artificial intelligence where the claim was that based on symbolic representations, a computer can be made to do anything. And Dreyfus correctly critiqued. In 1992, 20 years later, he wrote, he reissued that same book, but with a new introduction called What Computers Still Can't Do. So that's one way for those of you who are in academics to get two publications out of one. Uh, uh, but Dreyfus made the same critique that even now, what even though we have connectionist ideas as opposed to symbolic representations, they still don't have understanding. And much of what Dreyfus says is still true. But there is one area, I believe, where the bar between what computers could, can do and cannot do has been lowered substantially just in the last few years based on a deep understanding of reasoning. Okay, and I believe that understanding the roots of reasoning have profound implications for how the next generation of artificial intelligence will proceed. What do I mean? Okay, so coming back to our mouse, does the mouse reason? Does the mouse brain have signatures of reasoning defined as actions to optimize behavior? And I submit they do, and I submit that the mice do. And that we know from something very interesting when we look at the error trials, why does the mouse make a mistake? Sometimes the mouse makes a mistake. The mouse makes two kinds of mistakes. Sometimes it licks when it shouldn't. So there is a vertical bar. It should be a correct reject. And occasionally the mouse responds and that's called a false, false alarm. And, and the second kind of error is the mouse doesn't lick when it should. So it's horizontal bars and the mouse most of the time licks, but then occasionally it misses. Why does it miss? Or why does it importantly lick when it should? So is it an error in the visual cortex? No, the visual cortex neurons are still responding. And this is the beauty of reading out the mouse's brain's activity using such high resolution technologies, okay? The visual cortex shows no change between a correct reject and a false alarm. The mouse is seeing or not seeing the same stimulus. It sees vertical bars and in most instances it doesn't lick, but when it does lick, it still sees the vertical bars correctly. It is in the parietal cortex and the motor cortex that we see activity 
that says, these brain regions have told the mouse to go lick, when in most other instances, they have said, don't lick, and the mouse has performed correctly. So the source of error is activity in motor and parietal cortex. Why? So here's the idea. In reinforcement learning, there is a very powerful idea that error trials arise from exploration at the cost of exploitation. When we want to optimize our behavior, we must try out many different things. We must explore before we settle on what is optimal. That's what is meant by exploration at the cost of exploitation. Even when the mouse is doing a task that it has done for weeks. Its life depends on the task because it gets most of its water from the task. The mouse still explores because it's still trying to optimize. How can I get the most reward? And that is at the root of reinforcement learning. It's as if when you go from your home to work, how do you know what is the best road? You will never know unless you try different things, even if occasionally you take longer. So I live in a part of Cambridge. Uh, uh, it's called mid, mid, mid Cambridge and work at MIT. My lab is in a building that's about a mile away. The shortest road is shown in blue. I usually walk, uh, I occasionally drive. And when I'm driving, the shortest road is shown in blue. But every so often I take a different road just to see whether it will be shorter. And indeed, many times, and in fact, always now, the shortest road is not the best because you can see these yellow uh, regions that say there is a lot of traffic on these roads. So I actually take, so I do a tree structure. I start from home, then sometimes I will go this way to the brown, sometimes I'll go this way on the green path, Sometimes I'll go this way on the purple path and I've settled on the green path most of the time, but even now occasionally I try one of the other. Okay? So reinforcement learning is a powerful mechanism of reasoning. I'm reasoning, what is my best path? And I choose policies, meaning different paths that maximize value, meaning the time that I take. What does this have to do with artificial intelligence? Everything. Everything. So how much time do I have? Do I have five minutes? Well, you can take five minutes. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. I, I apologize, but okay. Let me pull it together very quickly. So artificial neural network, when you want to, what is the test bed of reasoning? It's games. Games, particularly games that are two player, that are zero sum, when one wins, the other loses, deterministic. Every point in the game can be, at least in theory, determined. It discrete, first I move, then you move. Markov, meaning there is no history to the game. A chess player or a Go player, this is another board game, can walk onto a game and play from that point on. It doesn't matter how you got to that point. These are Markov games. Because these features make the simulation of the game state perfect a computer can simulate them. And so artificial neural networks have had remarkable success in games with perfect information and deep search, so much so that in 1997, the, the, the IBM computer Deep Blue beat the reigning chess champion, Gary Kasparov, but Deep Blue did it by brute force. Deep Blue was trained by human trainers through supervised learning, and it figured out the tree structure of every move, starting with the first move. If the first move, there are 10 moves possible. You have eight pawns and two rooks, uh, two, 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 two knights. And then the other person has another 20 moves, and uh, another eight moves, or 10 moves, and then you have 20 moves, and so forth. You can do the tree structure. In fact, chess has 10 raised to the 120 moves. The atoms in the known universe are 10 raised to the 80. But not all 10 raised to the 120 moves need be considered. Human supervisor can narrow it down very rapidly. 
This was interesting, but not particularly exciting because it says brute force can win. Then in 2016, something interesting happened. That the program by, by a company called DeepMind made a program that beat the reigning Go champion. If you don't know what Go is, it's okay. It's a board game. It's even more complex than Go. And then in 2018, this program, which was based on reinforcement learning, beat the reigning chess program. So here's what I mean. So the first paper involving reinforcement learning as an algorithm, nonetheless with human beings doing supervised learning, chose policies or paths of action to maximize value, meaning winning or the best move at every game through a tree structure like I showed you for the humble example of going from home to work and it beat the reigning world champion. This at all. It was the first example of reinforcement learning being applied as an algorithm to beat a human player in a game that involved reasoning. Then they did something more interesting, this same uh, uh, group called DeepMind. They removed the human being from the equation. They simply said, here is the game. Here is what the pieces move. And the end result is you must have more pieces than your opponent. And then in 2018, they did something next that they used that same program with only two kinds of information. The pieces move in this way and you win in chess if you capture the opponent's king. With these two pieces of information and just playing against itself, no human being ever said, this is a good move or this is a bad move or now you are winning or now you are losing. This program called AlphaGo beat the best computer program. By the way, in chess, human beings are history. The most advanced chess, chess games take place between computer programs. In fact, the ELO score of the most advanced grandmaster is usually between 2,500 and, and, and 2,800. And the ELO scores, this is, this is, this is just a ranking of chess, chess players, okay? So, so super grandmasters are 3,000. And the computer programs, the best computer program till Alpha Zero came along was Stockfish. And Stockfish won the 2016 chess championship playing against other computer programs. And this program based on reinforcement learning as opposed to brute force beat the previous program and beat it handily shown here most of the time. So what does this mean? What does this program do? This program does very interesting creative things. Very humble example. Here is a ch chessboard that this program is playing and it has Money, many options. It rejects certain options outright, shown in red. If I was playing, I might choose one of them. It considers these two options, shown in yellow and green, and it chooses the green one. It's the most risky option, because when white is playing white, and you move it there, you have only one force on that, on that square, which is which is the bishop, right? So black has two forces, other pawn and the knight. But it moves because it enables this lane to be cleared up so that several moves down the line, that clean lane has enormous positional advantage. In fact, when this paper came out in 2018, where this program called AlphaGo taught itself to play chess based just on how two pieces move and what does it mean to win? Vishwanath Anand wrote a blog piece. And Vishwanath Anand, who's of course, India's famous chess player, grandmaster, five-time world champion says, it figured everything out from scratch and that is scary and promising. I would like to think that it should be a little bit harder. It feels annoying that you can work things out because it figured it out over several hours of playing with itself, but with massive computers, you know, tensor processors. 
not just the not just the GPUs that your laptop or your computer has. But then there was a very perceptive piece written by Gary Kasparov in that same journal, in the same issue of science. And Kasparov wrote a piece accompanying that paper called Chess, a Drosophila of Reason. Drosophila meaning a model organism in which you discover the basis of many mechanisms of life. What does Kasparov write? Kasparov writes, I admit I was pleased to see that Alpha Zero had a dynamic open style like my own. The conventional wisdom was that machines would approach perfection with endless dry maneuvering, usually leading to drawn games. But in my observation, Alpha Zero prioritizes peace activity over material, meaning it will sacrifice a pawn, a material, in order to get control of the activity of the board preferring positions that to my eye looked risky and aggressive, like this. Programs usually reflect priorities and prejudices of programmers, but because Alpha Zero programs itself, I would say that style reflects the truth. Reflects the truth. What does Kasparov mean? I believe this is a very interesting and important statement. Where does the logic of reasoning come from? Is it something that is created in our head that you create, that I create, and that we have independent access to, but subjective access, and I don't have access to your logic? Or is it that this logic, just like the laws of physical nature, this logic, the laws of this logic are actually laws of the mind that are universal, that this is the truth of the universe, and the fact that this program, without any access to human intervention, just based on the laws of moving, with the rules of moving, and what does it mean to win, figured this out, provides strong evidence for this deep idea that the states of the mind are also subject to rules and laws of the universe, and that we are a part of those laws. And why is this interesting? This is my last slide. So I have shown you many ways in which computers differ from brains. And there are, there are many physical ways in terms of power consumption. And there are meaningful ways, such as reconfigurable architectures and focus computations through attention and through representations that are sparse versus dense, et cetera. So there are lots of reasons to think that computers will not approach the complexity of the human mind. But already we see breaches. Turing in 1950 devised the Turing test where he said, if an intelligent, if a human being cannot from the answers to a set of questions, tell whether somebody behind a closed door, something behind the closed door is a human or a computer, we should call that computer intelligent. That has been laid, laid aside a long time ago. We have lots of examples where computers and humans cannot be discerned without knowing who is who. But then Searle made a more reasoned objection, similar to Dreyfus, meaning, computers ever understand what they're doing? Maybe, maybe not. But there is one area that used to be a bulwark, a bulkhead of human cognition, which is reasoning. And I believe that this bulkhead has been breached because when there are physical laws that govern a action, if we understand those laws, we can build machines. Birds fly and planes fly. And human beings have tried to fly in the way birds fly. Leonardo da Vinci built wings, but it took us the understanding of why flight occurs, that you have to overcome weight by lift, and you have to overcome drag by thrust, that human beings built airplanes. They don't look too much like birds, but they obey the laws of physics and overcome them. 
it wasn't always clear that the laws of the mind will be universal. But if they are, as the laws of logic and the laws of reasoning seem to be, then I believe that we will build machines that will not only exceed, but way exceed human capacities, just like an airplane way exceeds what a bird can do. Okay, so it may not happen in my lifetime, but in the lifetime of our students who are here, I am very confident, which will leave us with the, with the question. You know, technology brings opportunities and challenges. Every new technology transforms our life. This technology will go way beyond automation. It will transform the nature of work, including intellectual work, because reasoning is a powerful force for intellectual work. So how might its gains be equitably distributed? I will leave that for you to answer. So thank you very much. I apologize for going over and I will leave you with the members of my lab and our collaborators who have contributed in many ways to the experiments, at least from my lab that I talked about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sur. This has been a very enlightening talk. And uh, as, as Newton had said, right, I've seen further by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I learned a lot. And um, we have uh, about a dozen questions um, can you stay a little bit over time, sir? Yes, yes, I am, I'm happy to stay. And uh, I wish Dr. Bansal had stopped me because I had <laughs> asked her to give just... me a five minute, five minute warning. And here I am at 10.35, sorry. I wish I had known the time, you know, uh, my cell was all flowing, you know, it is so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we learned a lot. So um, what I'll do is I'll first start with a question of my own, and then I'll start with audience question, and then Divya will take over um, and asking other questions. So my first question to you is, so uh, mice or mouse has learned something, and you showed how from visual cortex it goes to is taking actions by, by going through the brain mechanisms. Uh, how does mice impart knowledge to the next generation of my, mice? You know, as you said, how do you distribute knowledge? <laughs> what you remember. So people don't have to explore everything themselves from yeah. zero. So this is something that, uh, of course, human culture is based on imparting knowledge in our lifetime. You know, we don't have to invent reading or writing or the artifacts of our life or many things we learn them from our peers, from our parents, from our teachers, and that's part of culture. Do mice have culture? In simple ways, they do. But what is, what is instinct and what is learning is much more blurred in mice. So there are, there are always, so the repertoire of what we can learn, what we can do, is shaped by the manifold of our physical and mental capacities, right? It's not that you or I can do anything and everything we want. We can't jump 10 feet because we have physical limits on what our muscles and what our bones can do. We can't do many other things and we can do others. So the humbler, so to speak, the organism, a mouse has only 50 million neurons as opposed to 80 billion that we do. And it is much more hardwired, yet it has learning to exist in the world. So this is all a long ways to say mice learn, mice can learn, mice do transfer some information to their young, but not such tasks, which are essentially meaningless for survival for a young, uh, unless they are part of our experiment. So. Very good, sir. Um, so I'll take a question from Vanishka uh, from Electrical Engineering 2021, saying what brain mechanisms allow us to focus on a specific task and ignore the rest of the environment? So that is attention, right? So when uh, the, the brain mechanisms that hopefully allowed you to focus on my presentation and ignore all the other things that you are sitting on a chair that is providing pressure. There is all kinds of sensory stimuli. There is some noise in the background. You ignore all of that. 
or you could choose to attend and ignore me which is fine and and uh, 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 so those are brain mechanisms for filtering and for sharpening they are brain mechanisms essentially of mind <laughs> as we understand today in the science of health and well being right so 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 those mechanisms how do they arise where do they arise i tried to give a little glimpse of that that it is the higher areas not the lower sensory areas such as the visual cortex but the parietal cortex and even in the motor cortex where the there is the elaboration of internal state we have yet a lot to understand still remaining to un- we have a lot remaining to understand about how attention works but we have some understanding based on neurotransmitter systems how certain stimuli can be amplified and others can be dampened as a consequence of excitation inhibition and neuromodulation so there are chemical bases and circuit bases for attention so i'll ask one more question divya before giving the control back to you this question comes from anil sharma our alum saying how does shock treatment affect our normal neural reaction well i presume you mean electroconvulsive shock meaning electrical shocks to the brain that's a very drastic thing it is used under very rigid in, in a very controlled conditions for certain kinds of brain disorders uh, 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 it is not clear what it does but obviously it quote unquote the attempt is to reset the brain in some way is to reset some brain region and uh, so that you instead of the normal flow of activity that characterizes a uh, a uh, uh, you know normal behavior i gave brief examples in the humble examples of a mouse uh, you know seeing something holding it in memory and moving or or licking even that humble activity you can read out the sequence of that if you were to shock the brain in the middle it would reset it would completely Uh, 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 you know, take apart or stop the mouse's behavior right away because all that flow has been disrupted. So, if you have abnormal flow, then that's the coarse logic of why you would even consider electroconvulsive shock. It is to d- disrupt flow that is abnormal. Hence, the hope is you would perhaps normalize. I am not sure of the evidence. so uh, i'll take it over from here uh, nareesh ji thank you for being here with us and i understand you have engagements uh, professor sur we have a lot of questions uh, pouring in so this time you'll also have to tell me when to stop <laughs> so we have this question from a computer science final year uh, student uh, who wants to know your views on micro uh, tubules and their connection with consciousness and another part of the question is that uh, does that is there a, bit, a peculiar symmetry which is present and what is a good starting point to solve consciousness so the answer to the first question on microtubules i know that roger penrose and others have speculated on various components of neurons that might be critical for consciousness and uh, i am a skeptic about uh, these theories so i'll just let i'll just leave it at that uh i didn't get the 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 second question what is there a speculum uh, symmetry so he wants to know that symmetry. is there a peculiar symmetry uh, present in a good, and is there a good starting point to solve consciousness i don't know i mean if you are talking about symmetry breaking as a way to think about brain function i think there is some merit to that idea but it is very abstract and how does it map on to what we regard as the components of consciousness i usually don't like to use the word consciousness much better for a practicing scientist like me to use operational terms like attention like working memory like planning like execution uh, 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 rather than consciousness these are all components of consciousness but these are components that we can measure that we can manipulate that we can seek the neural bases of so for some of these tasks for 
for, for some of these functions. Uh, uh, it is true that symmetry breaking forms an important component, even in the trajectories that I showed, which are the combined activity of hundreds of neurons. The fact that one component does one thing and then it switches to another component doing another that enables the animal to perform different components of the task is an aspect of symmetry. So uh, another question which I have, which stems, uh, you know, from what you said that you don't like to really use the word consciousness and instead the attention then. Now, so I always wonder that, uh, you know, why do psychiatrists use, uh, look at only the symptoms and then uh, go back, uh, you know, uh, while if the same patient goes to a neurologist, you know, he would like to throw a torch and use MRI uh, imaging and before concluding anything. So to summarize, if already we have the torch available, then why is the patient treated only on the basis of symptoms? By torch, you mean that we can look and understand the mechanisms and not, is that what you mean? MRI images of the right. brain. Yeah. MRI images are revealing of brain geography. What brain region is involved with a certain task or should be involved and is now not involved. So it is a geographical map of brain activity and function. It is something, but it doesn't reveal as much as we need to in order to understand and treat brain disorders. In fact, we are very far from understanding and treating any brain disorder. Maybe Parkinsonism, because Parkinsonism is due to the loss of dopamine-containing neurons in one part of the brain. And we can hope to replace that dopamine. But, uh, but, but that is, even with knowing that, that is complexity. So the fact is that Psychiatrists treat symptoms because that's what you can decipher. The, the, that's what you can read out from talking to the patient or from making some simple measurements. But the basis for your question, I think, is exactly right. Will we ever, to really treat brain disorders, we need to understand mechanism. And unless we understand mechanism, we will never have a good treatment. It's like when you get COVID, you have a fever. You can treat that fever with aspirin, but unless you understand why you have that fever, you know, is it due to an infectious disease? Is it due to tuberculosis or malaria or COVID or this or that? You don't have a good understanding of it. And so we are at this stage of aspirin for fever when it comes to brain disorders. Thank you so much. And I see that a lot of brains are further getting triggered from the output of the questions. And here is yet another one. Uh, is it a correct perspective that at least in the cases of social media addiction, the big tech uses reinforcement learning with the objective of maximizing attention while rewarding via dopamine? So that is using human neuroscience to maximize attention spans. And again, the question comes from a final year computer science student. Mm -hmm. Well, it has been written that, yes, the way that social media tries to hook you, tries to uh, 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 um, keep you attached to your device is by using certain tricks or certain elements of attention, what makes us attend, what makes us stay hooked, uh, what is rewarding. And so to that extent, whenever we think of reward uh, in relation to actions and stimuli, it is reinforcement learning. And dopamine is a powerful signal for reinforcement learning. So dopamine signals reward or the anticipation of reward. So uh, so, so to that extent, yes, I would have to say that uh, social media companies perhaps do understand uh, how to uh, 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 capture and retain attention. I'm glad that our computer science students uh, are listening to this. <laughs> so uh, also, uh, since your area of work is plasticity, so one of our student, Garishma from mechanical engineering, uh, wants to know that is there any way to increase the plasticity? Because for her, uh, 
understanding that the brain is uh, primarily plastic up to an age of 25 or 30s. So has science also made any breakthrough in this regard? Well, plasticity is not one thing. Plasticity has many different components. So our children have tremendously plastic brains when it comes to language, when it comes to learning sensory motor skills, right? And, but then other kinds of plasticity persist. In fact, you need a certain level of brain development in order to engage plasticity that enables the next thing. All brain function and learning and plasticity lives on a manifold of brain architecture. So the brain needs to have developed up to a certain point in order to take advantage of the world or of learning. A newborn infant, it's too early for a newborn to learn language. Age of two, three, four, enough brain connections have happened that the external world of sound and sights and symbols can be interpreted and devised into language. Okay. And it's an explosive time for language, for instance. So that's one of the best examples of how plasticity is not just that the earlier is better, it needs the right kind of preparation and the right kind of architecture and what I call manifold for it to be expressed. So in adulthood, there are certain kinds of plasticity likely possible, though we have to use it or otherwise we would lose it. And some of these perhaps have to do with experiential uh, 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 wiring or how to incorporate uh, life experiences and societal experiences into one's behavior and cognition. But by and large, yes, plasticity does decline with age. Yeah, so another related question as a follow-up question that I see is that uh, why does the brain has to shrink? And uh, I think that already stands uh, answered. So uh, uh, another question coming from a student, Ashish Jen, uh, how do we train machines on general intelligence instead of specific ones like the chess that you talked about? And how do we train them to focus attention according to the context? And if there are any ways to do that? So general intelligence has fallen by the wayside. And so the tests of general intelligence are nonetheless specific because they are based on you know, matching or prediction or pattern recognition. They all speak to some specific components of the mind. Okay? And if you have familiarity with those kinds of questions, those kinds of tests, you will do well on tests of so-called general intelligence. But intelligence is much more than pattern recognition or matching. Intelligence is also social intelligence. How do you read a certain situation? Or intelligence is also hand-eye coordination and visual motor intelligence. How fast can you react to some situation? Athletes are tremendously, have tremendous body and body-mind intelligence, for instance, professional athletes in many sports. So it is, I think, something that society needs to uh, uh, understand and appreciate. There is no one intelligence. And the idea of general intelligence, we should set aside. There are intelligences and different people have different capacities for different components of such intelligences. So I think one would never have a computer that does everything in the same way, just like we don't have human beings who do everything equally well. And how might we program attention? I think that there are networks, there are ways in which to do it. The issue is, there is a chicken and egg problem. What should one attend to determines how to make it work. And so uh, what should one attend to means 
some understanding of the world that I must now listen to this fellow who is you know, giving a lecture and I should not attend to my cell phone or to this or that or the other. And so that one, in very simple cases, one could prescribe these or teach a computer, but in very many cases, it's very context dependent. But the actual implementation may not be so hard. It is basically sending signals or increasing the gain of certain connections uh, uh, based on uh, such contextual information. Uh, maybe, maybe we can take one more question because it's almost 11 at my, at my end, probably 8.30 at your end. Absolutely. So I think uh, I have another question which has come to me on another channel uh, and by a first year student. So let me ask his question and then we uh, close the session with that. Uh, and it seems to be a very interesting question. So he uh, seeks his views. Uh, I'm sorry, he seeks your views about uh, hip, uh, hypnosis, uh, subconscious mind and the memory metaphors. Uh, who came first, the genes or the human body? And uh, he would therefore also uh, like to know that, uh, is there any scientific basis of how the genes uh, remember from the past? So that's not one question. That's like five questions. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know whether I can answer any of them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, I'll 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 I'll, I'll uh, take it from uh, from the from the most <laughs> from the last to the first as as best as I can. So, what is it that genes do? I don't think genes do anything other than make proteins. And so then the issue is, what do the proteins do? And they do a lot of things. They act in synapses. They 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 make neurons work, and neurons make networks and networks make the brain and brains make human beings function in the world. So this entire chain of life is what one needs to keep in mind when one talks about learning or memory. Okay? You need the molecules that genes make in order to encode plasticity, to make a synapse stronger. You need to have the molecules that make synapses work. And you need to, for instance, insert glutamate receptors at synapses, which require specific cell biological processes that when they happen, make a synapse work faster, work, work, work better, become stronger. And when hundreds of thousands and millions of such synapses uh, are strengthened, you have an engram and a memory. But you can't say that this gene makes my memory. That's too long a road. Mm -hmm. Human beings have memories, not genes. Yeah. All right. Before that, there was a question about, um, maybe I should let it go at that, because it's now almost time, right? Is that OK? So yeah, absolutely. And thank All you right. so much for satisfying this curious uh, mind of ours. And uh, before uh, uh, anything, I would ask if Professor Sangi wants to steal in a moment. And then after that, I would ask uh, request Professor Grover uh, to formally thank our speaker. Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, request Professor Grover because it's already too late. Uh, thank you very much for answering so many questions. And one, one thing I noticed today's talk was uh, we had a lot more questions from our students. You know, and generally I see that our alumni ask a lot of questions, but today our students are asking a lot of questions, which was really very positive. Thank you. Professor Grover. So, okay, I have to be quick. To start with, I would like to thank Mrigan for making this wonderful lecture possible. So, Professor Dirai Sanghi had a, this very innovative way of commemorating the centenary of PEC and in pandemic times, we hold lectures to commemorate such events, but he says in pandemic times, we'll turn it into an advantage and we'll invite the very best available globally to talk to us on a whole variety of things in the 21st century where interdisciplinarity is the buzzword. 
I mean, you go to a college, you learn something, but what you are going to do in the rest of your life, okay, is depends on how you make use of the opportunities before you. So this has been the spirit in which all the lectures have been held, and uh, your lecture and your life journey is a perfect example of how the engineers must think when they are when they enrolled in a college like Punjab Engineering College. So PEC attracts some of the best students from our region. So the PEC alumni is also is is in the civil society. You can see they are the leaders wherever they are. So this. Lecture attracts that many questions because the students are bright and the alumni is also bright. So I'm very grateful to you, and I want to thank, in addition to Dheeraj, also Divya, and also Kaya, who accepted my suggestion to persuade you you to give a talk at the PEC forum. And I had one more hidden agenda, and as you said it right, right in the beginning, that. Hargobind Khurana is the father of chemical biology or the biotechnology. So Chandigarh today and its institutions, the strength of that is biotechnology and life sciences. We have CSR's Institute of Microbial Technology. We have DBT's uh, National Agro-Food Biotechnology Institutes. So one of my dreams is to organize a Hargobind Khurana Perth Centenary Symposium in January of 2022 in an online mode. And I wanted your lecture to act as some kind of a stimulus that the entire life sciences community in Chandigarh gets enthusiastic about uh, organizing this, telling the world what they are doing, and also learning from the rest of the world, okay, where the frontiers of their field lie. So thank you very much. Your lecture has done this job. Uh, since every, your lecture is recorded, so those who could not listen to your lecture, I would use recorded version of your lecture to see that the whole community is energized and we commemorate the birth centenary of Khargov and Khurana by organizing a global meet. And I would request you to join us also during that meet. So thank you very much. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. Going to leave it's now. an absolute honor to have you. Okay, bye. Thank you very much.